Uh, today's talk is going to be given by Professor Sanjita Menon, who has been at NIOS for quite some time, I think for 12 to 13 years or so. And uh, she has been interested, uh, firstly, in problems related to consciousness from a philosophical point of view. And of course, by training and by, I think, interest, she is also a psychologist. Therefore, uh, she has the background of psychology and philosophy, which is rather unusual. Today's talk is on body absence and self-sense. Every one of those words to me uh, is a big problem. Body absence for me would be a very difficult thing to envisage what it means what body absence is. And I certainly well, I'm selfish. I don't know what self is really. So, what is self sense is something which she has to educate us. And then she talks about the old heart problem, which is essentially, you know, the problem that the scientist, particularly neuroscientist, faces in trying to understand how one kind of uh, experience we have in the laboratories of, uh, particularly physics laboratories or biological laboratories of uh, chemicals, electrical pulses and so on, which is what the uh, normal neuroscientist thinks. Essentially what happens in the brain is just some physical chemical activity, physical chemical, electrochemical activities. So how they create feelings, sensations, etc., which is an entirely different category of our experience. So that is a real hot problem, how to understand that. Now she is talking about a new heart problem. This heart problem was first, though it's a, it is the problem in the field of consciousness studies, it was brought into fresh focus uh, more recently by, uh, by an Australian scientist. I forget his name. Oh, huh? Oh. Uh, Chalmers, actually. Uh, because it's a very old problem. Because that is the problem in how to understand the normal experience with the extraordinary experience that we have. The new heart problem, she is going to tell us, my feeling is that if you solve the old heart problem, if you understand how you can relate the physical with the mental in a proper way, then I think all problems are solved. But I am as anxious as you are all to hear that. Uh, Thank you, Professor Shikantan. Good morning to all of you, and uh, thanks for being here, in spite of a rainy morning and perhaps traffic jam. Many of you would have heard about uh, Francis Crick's The Astonishing Hypothesis, published in 1994, with a subtitle, Scientific Search for the Soul. And this often quoted line, perhaps in this auditorium and in the lecture hall, perhaps by Professor Shikandan himself many times, that you, and the underlines are mine, that you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will, are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Give your attention to the words which are underlined. The you, which is put in double quote, for Crick it is a non-existent entity, no more than, because he is very sure that it is just a behavior and it's a fiction to talk about a self. And also, he subtitled his book, A Scientific Search for the Soul, which again is a sarcasm, that there is nothing called soul and there's nothing for science to look at what could be called as soul. So he, would, he was not even interested in the idea of self, perhaps which would have a slightly non-mystic connotation. But then, days have passed since Crick published this book and the astonishing hypothesis, astonished at least a few people. Many pages have been written on self. And today, the idea of self is one of the most important problems for neuropsychiatry and neuropsychology and of course in neuroscience as well. It is no more a philosophical muddle but it's a most important puzzle to be solved. 
And what exactly would be the nature of such a puzzle, which Crick uh, dismissed by underlying and in putting in double chord the U? The fundamental problem is that the question, is my inner awareness of myself separate from my body? There are at least three levels of awareness here, but I wouldn't go into it. But that, that, uh, that small sentence of few words itself could take uh, many hours of discussion. Is my inner awareness of myself separate from my body? Basically, is your body sense separate from your self sense? For a moment, if we can see that there is something called the body sense and a self sense which are separate, our questions would be, are the body sense and the self sense distinct? Are they separate? If they are not separate, how are they entangled? Because I experience them together. And the most important and perhaps most interesting question for everyone, even not even I mean, even a non-academic would be, what constitutes these basic everyday senses? How, do, how is that possible that we have a neat, clear sense of the body sense or the self sense? But before going into that, I thought I should make uh, myself clear in which sense I use uh, the word sense. Usually, the word sense means a meaning intended or conveyed. For example, you would say, what you say makes sense to me. Another idea of sense is being consciously aware. You would say, oh, finally he came to his senses. The third possibility is of a vague awareness. I get a sense that something is not quite right. Another set of three possibilities for senses, and of course for today's discussion, one is the faculty to perceive. Sense would also mean sensation of sight, the ability to see, ability to see, ab ability to hear, ability to smell, ability to touch, and ability to taste. The other is a control of movement, maintaining posture, and having an intuitive automatic body sense, which is technically called as the proprioceptive capability. It's a very important sense which we have and which we take along with us as we move and interact. And the third, which I like most, is a very fundamental and closest to feeling, the I am awareness. In this lecture, I'll be using sense with all the above three meanings. And I would try to make a distinction if I'm, making, if I'm talking about anyone in particular. Let's begin by asking friends this question about self sense and body sense. Are they distinct? A dominant view, which is popularly classified as reductionist, but of course it's doing an injustice to just club this under one large category, but since we don't have time, the large category of reductionist way of looking at it is the self sense is the body sense. And the is is uh, bold because there's absolutely no doubt about it. And I'm sure India would agree with me in that. That who I am is closely tied to my embodied existence. My body says what I am and the condition of body, my body would say what I am. There's nothing else. I cannot sense myself without the accompanying body sense. There's no sense of self separate from the self of, from the sense of body. The second larger view would be the self sense is not just a sense, but is the essence. It's very interesting that this word sense, uh, you know, there's a lot of similar sounding words here. That self sense is not just a sense, but the essence. I amness, the feeling, the awareness, is essential, deep, and the core. Embodiment, being in the body and feeling the body sense, is in fact only one aspect of the self sense. This last view is nothing new. You would see this view if you read the Upanishads, if you read Pythagoras and other Greek philosophers. So it's a, it's a much older view. Now let's come to understanding what exactly do we mean by body sense. Though we all 
are capable of body sense and are having a body sense. We are all in our seats and we are sitting and listening to this. The body sense primarily is a combination of internal senses. And these internal senses are pain, and pain itself is of different types. A pinprick is a different pain, a stomachache is a, a different pain, a toothache is a different pain, a headache is a different pain. Of course, I didn't include the mental pain here, I just mean the physical pain. Then balance. When you walk, we are so comfortably walking without even thinking, I should be walking in a such a way that I wouldn't be falling. It is so automatic to us that we don't realize it. And the, the third and fourth, of course, we all, I think, very, very concretely experience thirst and hunger. Apart from these internal senses, there are also a, a group of external senses, which again, uh, we all are familiar with in our experience and in our discussion, which is hearing, vision, taste, touch, and smell. Now, apart from this, the body sense is influenced by a few other sets of parameters which we don't know whether it is completely physical, whether it has an element of mental aspects to it. This is again something which kind of continuing to be discussed. But let me share with you what this means. Perhaps some of you must be already knowing these terms, but uh, basically the meaning of this is very simple and we all experience. Only the words look sound, sound very technical. Proprioception. Proprioception is a collection of intuitive, automatic capabilities that we have to perceive location, movement and action of parts of the body and to perceive the parts of the body in relation to each other and it helps us to have an intuitive, immediate measure of the effort I require for different things. When I lift this pen, it's a particular measure of effort and the body intuitively know how much is that measure. When I take something which is heavy, the measure of effort is different. The body intuitively calculates the measure of the effort. And we are able to take postures and maintain our postures without falling. When you sit in a chair, you are able to sit in a chair without falling. This again owes to what is called as proprioceptive ability. The other important factor which influences the body sense is what is again technically called as the body maps in the brain. The body maps in the brain are basically representations of the body in the brain. Every point of our body is represented in the brain. And this map influences the way we respond to complex problems, whether it is cognitive or effective. And the interesting thing is that the body maps are continuously updated and reorganized as we move along, change our attitudes, uh, the change of way we approach things and so on, change of our lifestyles. The so body map is something which is very flexible and continuously changes. Uh, the importance of body map is so much that one of the science communicator, I mean to be precise, uh, Sarah Blakesley, who wrote the famous book on brain maps, described brain map as the inner self map. And it's amazing that science would even consider a concept like inner self. Uh, there's another set of uh, ideas, which again is in discussion, which is generally called as the mirror systems. And of course, you would have heard about mirror neuron championed by V.S. Ramachandran. Basically, mirror systems, uh, of course, body maps form part of the mirror systems, and they uh, mirror the world with which we interact. And uh, the body maps basically explain the way we respond to situations. It also explains our ability to learn by imitation, to form a theory of mind, know other minds, and uh, predict another person's behavior, and also explain our ability to empathize with another person. In short, our myriad capacity of social behavior is explained by the existence of mirror neurons. And if you ask me what are these mirror neurons, they are just a class of neurons which become active when you perform an action and also when you watch another person 
performing the same action. Uh, this is something which is very interesting, but uh, we wouldn't have much time to go into, but perhaps in another lecture, the body map itself is a very interesting concept. The fourth is something extremely exciting, at least for me it is extremely exciting, and I would say why in a minute. The peripersonal space. What exactly is the peripersonal space? The brain, interestingly, not only maps every point of the body, but also the personal space around the body, which includes objects, the tools which we use, people, values which we have, cultural rituals we perform, and so on and so forth. I would think the whole idea of the peripersonal space is a response to the whole puzzle of the subjective nature of the body sense. Subjectivity is something which is inherent in the body sense and how do we explain it? I mean either you have to understand the body sense itself capable of including something which is non-physical. And uh, I mean to explain this further, the importance of peripersonal space, when you drive your car, your peripersonal space includes the car and at that time you means you plus the car and this explains the road rage which you often see you have a small brush on your car you really get violent because that person has really brushed you not your car and uh, the classical example of course uh, by an English writer is that this the woman who wears the hat and when she has to go through a passage which has a low ceiling she uh, ducks her head because she intuitively know how much space she would need for that the hat wouldn't be uh, touched by the ceiling. Uh, peripersonal space basically uh, described as extending to the tip of your arm's length. So whatever you hold and that the end of that tool would define the limit of your peripersonal space. And in a sense you can say that the peripersonal space integrates the tools we use, I mean, whatever tools, whether it, it could be a PC, it could be a walking stick, it could be a, a spectacle and so on and so forth, the dress we wear, uh, houses we live, values we hold and so on and so forth. And again, peripersonal space is not something static, it keeps updating itself as we change, as we change our lifestyles, as we change our attitudes, as we change our tools and ways of interacting with the external world. I think one idea which we have to keep in mind that why peripersonal space is so central to the discussion today is that for the first time there is a suggestion from neurobiology and neuroscience itself that the body sense extends beyond the physical limits of the body and this is a much debated philosophical problem that body is no more the biological body but the cultural and psychological components included into it, integrated into it. And uh, as you know, many philosophers have questioned the whole idea of body and the constitution of the body itself. Peripersonal space gives you, allows you the space to question the limitation or the limits, the physical limits of the body. Uh, let me also share with you a few other dominant views, which is uh, more scientific in a sense to put it, body sense is described as a composite of what is called as body schema and body image. Body schema includes what I just described earlier, a set of pre-conscious subpersonal processes which is formed of proprioceptive and sensory information. And because of the body schema, movement and maintenance of post posture is possible without a conscious deliberate effort. The other uh, aspect of body sense, a component of body sense is the body image, which is actually the conscious representation, which is formed of concepts, perceptions, beliefs, intentions, emotions, and attitudes. When we talk about body sense, there are two functions which comes to our mind immediately. One is the ownership. When I move my hand, I know that it is my hand which is moving. I own the hand which is moving and also it is that I am moving my hand. So I own the moving hand as well as I am the agent of the hand which is moved. And this again 
is a very complex sensation, but then we feel it so intuitively and automatically, hardly any uh, uh, hardship is needed to have that such a sensation. But then, is that so for everyone? No. There are cases where people lose, lose sensation of the body, in particular, in specific, people who are quadriplegic and to a, a large extent also people who are paraplegic. People who have no sensory sensation below the neck, the neck down, people who are in wheelchairs. For them, there is immediate dis disruption in body maps and proprioception. They don't have the sense of the body parts, though they are physically intact. And please stress that point. The body part is physically intact. Your body part below the neck is intact. But then you don't have, you have no sensation of the body part. There is another phenomenon, very interestingly, the phantom phenomena, which many of you would have heard, again made uh, a, a popular topic by V.S. Ramachandran, is that in amputees who have lost a leg, or, or for example a leg, they would feel a pain on the tip of the small toe. And what is ir ironical here is the leg is absent, but then your pain of the little toe is coming, is coming from nowhere. You don't have a body, but then you have the pain of that body which is absent. The body part is absent, but the sensation remains. And this is basically called as the phantom phenomenon. It can happen anywhere. So two questions, friends, we have to keep in mind at this juncture, which are very important, is what is that sense which recognizes that there is an absence of the body sense? My neck down, my body part is intact, but then I'm not feeling that body sense. So what is that which tells you that there is an absence of the body sense? Of course, what is that sense which feels the sensation of the body part which is physically absent? Which is again very interesting. The physical body is absent, but then you have the sensation of the body. So what is that which sense which feels that sensation? With this uh, uh, introduction to the body sense, I'll go to my favorite topic, which is the self-sense. To begin with biology, because uh, biology is of course the beginning of all discussions. Uh, I myself am a student of biology. Biologists consider self or understanding of self to begin with, with the notion of self-recognition. If you are able to recognize yourself as an independent entity that exists separate from the environment, you recognize yourself. And that is an uh, important reason to establish a concrete identity of yourself. You are an agent of your bodily movements, you make, you make choices, you have intentions and you perform actions. And most important here is that you make a distinction between the changes that happen in the body and in the environment. And uh, many biologists, of course, I think Anindya has said uh, about this test perhaps many times in his lecture, which is called as the mirror test, that uh, when, you, uh, when a mirror is shown, cats, dogs, and macaques are not able to, uh, are not able to recognize their self, but they are able to respond to it. They have a sense of social, for example, macaques have a sense of social self. They are able to recognize hierarchies in their group and so on and so forth. But they do not have a sense of self. But chimps, they differ in that. Chimps are able to recognize their self. If a chimp has a, a spot, a painted spot on the body and a mirror image is shown, the chimp is able to recognize itself by pointing to the marked spot on its body. Humans, of course, we don't have to go into it. I would think the most important idea of the self-sense, of course the biological approach to it is significant, but I think the most important is, apart from just one aspect of self-recognition, is that there is a subjective, organic self-sense. I am the thinker of my thoughts, I am the experiencer of my emotions, I am the beholder of my values, attitudes, and most importantly, owner of all this organically at one time. They don't come to me in discrete elements. They are available to us 
in an organic fashion. But then the puzzle is that an accurate description of that most intimate, easily available sense is almost impossible. And that is why some of us have still have a job here. To share with you one more idea about the self, to give a, a kind of a counter view, Ulrich Neisser is a, a psychologist. He talks about five aspects of self. One is ecological, which is basically of a biological approach to it, that the self is that which is able to separate itself from the environment and respond to the environment. The other is interpersonal. We are able to relate to other people and uh, interact with others. Extended is that aspect of self which overlooks over a period of time and then we have a personal identity which is formed over a period of time. The private is we are able to go into our own minds, our own selves and have very private uh, thinking and discussion, internal thinking about our own self. Conceptual is that we are able to have a concept of the self. That is why I am able to recognize another person also as a self. Ulrich's point is that, uh, idea is that these are rarely experienced distinct. He also considers this as an organic uh, entity, but they differ in their developmental histories, in their immediacy, how immediate they are available to us, and what they contribute to human experience. And of course, they are subject to different kinds of pathologies as and when it comes. One more idea I thought I should share with you. I have not read Wittgenstein, studied Wittgenstein so much, but I thought this is something which many of us are aware and something very interesting. Wittgenstein makes uh, a distinction between two kinds of the first person. By the way, Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein is a uh, philosopher who worked on these ideas in a very serious manner. Uh, he said there are two kinds of the first person. One is that could be mistaken at times, the object of my thought. And the other is that can be mistaken at no time. When I say that, when I think, I think there will be a traffic jam in Malayshuram today, God forbid. Uh, my thinking of a traffic jam in Malayshuram could be wrong. But that I am thinking that thought can never be wrong. That I am the thinker of that thought can never go wrong. In fact, another uh, philosopher psychologist, Sidney Shoemaker, extended it further and made it more uh, explicit that uh, he described this as immunity to error through misidentification. Self-access is immediate. You access yourself immediately. There is no distance, no time in between. And one does not have to think about it to verify it. In cognitive neuroscience, there are two ideas which uh, welcomes the concept of self. And these two ideas are the ideas of the minimal self and the narrative self. The minimal self is that part or that entity which is called as self, which has the basic functions and still can be called as the self. And technically, it is defined as the minimal self is that which is accessible immediately in a particular moment. That which is available in a particular moment and exhausted in that moment. But then that feeling also comes with the immediacy of ownership and agency of action. The other aspect of self is the narrative self with extended functions. It's not that we, we experience ourselves only for a moment, but we experience ourselves also over a period of time, over a period of days and months and years and so on. And that is why we are able to remember experiences from the past, we are able to plan for the future. And the crux of the theory of narrative self is that we use words to tell stories and in these stories we create what is called as oneself. And you would have got the idea here that what we call as the self is a figment of fiction. And these are the four big uh, Pidamahas or uh, big uh, important names in this field. And uh, Dennett, Daniel Dennett talks about the non-minimal selfie self. And I read uh, the context in which he talks about the non-minimal selfie self. 
And why he uses the word selfie is very interesting here, and I encourage you to read it. I don't want to describe it here, but uh, it has something uh, which has a sense of humor, and uh, it's interesting. I'll, I'll just say that and encourage you to read uh, Dennett and to know why he introduces the word called selfie. Does that sound with something else? I leave it to you. According to him, the self is an abstract center of narrative gravity, which means there is nothing called as a self. It is an abstract center of narrative gravity, and narrative itself is something which we form using words. Gassenica, uh, he gives a biological pointer, and he says it's the less left hemisphere of the brain, which is the interpreter and generator of the self-narratives. Gallagher, he talks about a distributed, decentered self in contrast to what call, uh, Dennett calls as the uh, abstract center. According to Gallagher, it is distributed and it is decentered. Damasio, of course, a famous author, many of you would be knowing, he talks about the core and autobiographical self and read here core as the minimal and autobiographical as the narrative self. For Damasio's core is the minimal self and his autobiographical self, in a sense, is the uh, narrative self. I have a question here of the main project for cognitive neuroscience. It is to minimalize the minimal self further. What I wish to call as the minimalism project. And the central question for the minimalism project is, is there an even more primitive, and stress the word primitive, primitive aspect to the minimal self, which is not even conceptualized as myself in an immediate experience. And it's important that we focus on the primitive word primitive, which means something which could be considered as the very basic. But what is that basic is to be discussed and debated. And such a minimal self or the minimalistic minimal self would be even prior to having the sense of ownership, which comes along with minimalism. It is uh, pre-linguistic. It is uh, non-conceptual. And it is also the most basic and uh, defined by one of the others as the stripped down version of the self. And the idea which, is, uh, which they are arriving at here is such a minimal self can be initiated in an artificial system, a robot which moves around. And again, the three authors who are champions of this thinking and we might uh, see more ideas coming from them on the minimalistic minimal uh, self uh, Strassen, Galen Strassen, the famous son of famous uh, father, philosopher father, Gallagher, Sean Gallagher, and Daniel Dennett. Why minimalism is insufficient? I mean, this is a question, a poser, which I would like to pose for myself. One reason is that it is too minimal to explain the richness of experience. And remember the stress on the word primitive? The minimalistic minimal self talks about a very primitive sense. But then, the self which you and I are familiar with is not a primitive self, but it is an organic self, which comes as a whole. Damasio talks about the core self which is continuously reinterpreted. How it is, how it can stay core when something is continuously reinterpreted? What is that which sustains it? Another difficulty which I have personally is a, a particular word which is used often, the behavior. The experiences of joy, sorrow are not just given behaviors of your brain or of a primitive system, but they are the complex expressions of the self-sense. By reducing them to behavior, we are not able to reduce the complexity in the way which we experience it. In short, I would think that the neural origins are insufficient to explain the self-sense, primarily because the self-sense is the prime motivator of our experience and the possibilities for newer experience. And as one uh, author said, the more theories, scientific theories of self, of course, along with comes the philosophical theories as well. At the most, they can be informed speculation, and there are no well-chartered answers on the idea of self. Uh, 
When we talk about body sense and self sense, there is something which is again interesting, which is the entanglement of the body sense and self sense. At no time, or at least in a given situation, at no moment we are able to separate the body sense and self sense in a neat manner. They are kind of entangled and intertwined. And this is uh, particularly made clear if we listen to Jonathan Call, who describes his quadriplegic patients who are incapable of intentional movement, they have no intuitive body sense, and they have a body absence, but a self sense. They have the urge to experience the body and to be a whole self. And let me read a little bit from what uh, Cole writes along with uh, Gallagher. IW is one of his uh, patient, a subject suffers from an acute sensory neuropathy in which large fibers below the neck have been destroyed by illness. As a result, IW has no proprioceptive function and no sense of touch below the neck. At the onset of the neuropathy, IW's initial experience was of complete loss of control of posture and movement. He could not sit up or move his limbs in any controllable way. Maintaining posture, which we are doing now, is for him an activity rather than an automatic process. His movement requires constant visual and mental concentration. In darkness, he is unable to control movement. When he walks, he cannot daydream. And of course, not to talk about daydreaming when driving. But he must concentrate constantly on his movement. When he writes, he has to concentrate on holding the pen and on his body posture. For the first three months, even with the visual perception of the location of his limbs, he could not control his movement. In the course of the following two years, while in a rehabilitation hospital, IW gained sufficient motor control to feed himself, write and walk. He went on to master everyday motor tasks of personal care, housekeeping, and those movements required to work in an office setting. If you have not read Jonathan Call, I encourage you to read him, very different kind of author and who has started a different way of writing uh, medical narratives. And uh, what is interesting in his book, particularly the book, The, uh, the Still Lives, he narrates the experience of this 12 quadriplegic and paraplegic patients using six traits which can be compared only to the self and of self-motivation. These are, let me just list uh, these traits to you but won't go into the detail. He talks about six traits, enduring, exploring, experimenting, observing, empowering and continuing. The question we have to ask is, what it is like to live without sensation and movement? If the body has absented itself, where does the person reside? The feeling of making choices and having control over the body, to which sense does it belong? And the most important question here is, are the body sense and self sense intricately intertwined? Or does the self sense override the body sense? And interestingly, to examine the body sense and self sense separately, even conceptually, give rise to the new heart problem. So the new heart problem is, even conceptually a hard problem, which is to distinguish the body sense from the self sense. Is it even possible? I'll come to almost my end of my lecture and to once again talk about the self sense. I would consider, of course I wish to hear more from you and learn from you, I would consider the self sense as the very first and the last sense. If, if you may ask, is it just an inner sense like the proprioceptive body sense? I would think that the first and the last moments of self-awareness is not a thought or a feeling, but a deep organic sense. Our self-sense is not a minimalistic sense. But please stress, I, I wish to stress this idea and please uh, give some attention to the word organic and intense at any moment even for a quadriplegic without, with proprioceptive challenges. 
And self-sense, the organic self-sense, is not something you can cut into parts and then a gradient trace, saying that here the self-sense is beginning to express and there it is very intense. It is difficult and I wouldn't even know how to follow such a gradient. The self-sense comes as a whole. It is a continuous presence. It's a continuous presence of what? We don't know. And it is not, definitely it is not easy to articulate. I will end the note on the self-sense with two interesting quotes. One from my favorite philosopher Abhinava Gupta. He talks about the sensation of taste being responsible for invoking a deeper self-sense in Tantra Loka. When the ears are filled with the sound of sweet song or the nostrils with the scent of sandalwood, the state of indis indifference disappears and the heart is invaded by a state of vibration. Such a state is precisely the so-called power of beatitude, thanks to which the human is gifted with heart. Gerard Hopkins, a Jesuit priest and a Victorian Times poet, describes his self-sense using another description called as a self-taste. And it's very interesting that both these, uh, the, 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 uh, the philosopher as well as the poet here, uses a sensory medium to explain something which is otherwise intense in the form of self. Gerard Hopkins uses the body sensation of taste to describe the essence and the intense sense of self. My self being, my consciousness and feeling of myself, that taste of myself, of I and me above in all things, which is more distinctive than the taste of ale or alum, more distinctive than the smell of walnut leaf or camphor, and is incommunicable by any means to another man. Nothing else in nature comes near this unspeakable stress of pitch, distinctiveness, and selving, this self being of my own. I wish to leave with a few outstanding questions for myself to learn further and to take this project further. Will the trend for extracting a minimal self payoff, even if you are considering an artificial system which is as intelligent as the human mind, if you are considering a minimal self, how much of the sensation is needed to call the self sense minimal? Without any sensation, can it be called a self sense at all? What is the sense of the self in bodies with spinal cord injuries and limited or no proprioception? Can the self sense, if it does, that ensue from brain map, tell us about what is distinctive about it. And the next three questions are very important even philosophically. How much of the self is in the other? This is a topic which I have not discussed at all today. How much of the self is in the body sense? How much of it is not dependent on the body sense? And a question, how much of the self is even amenable to neurobiological inquiry? I have two assumptions to make and most of my thoughts are based on these two assumptions. That just as brain is a map making mechanism, representing body, its environment, physical, psychological and culture, the self is a meaning making mechanism. It helps us to make sense of everything else around and within. Because we, I mean the cognitive neuroscience, might do away with the self-sense by theory, theorizing its absence causally to neural behavior. But still, the self-sense persists organically in our actual everyday experiences. Even the person who talks about the minimal self, who postulates the minimal self, is a person. It's a self with likes and dislikes, with prejudices, priorities, and so on. It, it is not that he has a value-free neural self. So the final question I have is, can we do away with self-sense phenomenologically? I would think it is impossible. Thank you very much.
sure there must be quite a lot of questions. So we have some time for discussion. So I would like to encourage you to ask for the next half an hour or so, whatever doubts, whatever clarifications, questions uh, you may have. Before that, uh, I must mention one interesting thing that uh, Sangeeta Manan started with a quotation from Crick's book, The Astonishing Hypothesis. Probably she didn't tell you how the book ends. The last, after 262 pages, Crick says, this astonishing hypothesis may be right, may not be. It's possible that the, all the explanation may come from an entirely different way of looking at things and maybe from a religious experience. This was very surprising to me because it's an excellent book dealing entirely with uh, the developments in neuroscience and how one understands that. But at the end he says that this whole hypothesis may be right or wrong. So I think we have to keep a very open mind because if it comes from a novel art of the caliber of uh, Crick, uh, then uh, we have to take it very seriously. The second thing I would like to mention is that one of his uh, collaborators, Koch, he has now written a new book in which what is most surprising is that uh, they have come back to the idea that there is a homunculus. You know, there was a time uh, in uh, biological history when one thought in the mind there is a homunculus, that means there is another little human being who is the person who really interprets everything. Kind of but now what Cox uh, says is that uh, there is no such uh, human being there by saying that there is something similar to ourselves. But there is a center there where all the information is processed. And that is something which is again uh, 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 very, and I don't know whether every biologist agrees with that, but that is what the book says. So I thought I would just mention these two, and I now encourage you to ask uh, uh, questions, whatever. Yes? In trying to probe uh, maybe the, you know, more the definition structure, physiology, whatever it is of the self-sense, Maybe it is important to ask a fundamental question, who is the experiencer of everything? You know, all of the external senses, all of the internal senses, hunger, thirst, etc. Who is the experiencer? And to, uh, you know, add to that, that any experience we see in the external world must have a static thing for the experience to happen. For example, for a photo to be captured, there has to be a static CCD array or a photographic plate. For a uh, Writing to be captured, there has to be static paper. Now, all of the, you know, as a layperson, neurobiology and the science that I've read cannot pinpoint anything in the brain that is static, that is not changing over time. Every cell, everything changes. So, is there an answer there that of who is the experiencer? Well, it's a tough question, uh, Tabas, uh, but it's a very important question. Uh, well, uh, I think the who question is not even important for neuroscience. And uh, they are more interested in what, you know, what it is made of, what is constituted. Who immediately would take us to a, a psychological, philosophical base and the nature of such a person, a, the idea of a person comes there. But here, it is not looked from as a person, but as a biological entity, which is uh, uh, subjected to the forces of nature. But uh, I mean definitely that question is very important and I, I personally am very interested in that question and I think most of philosophy uh, would ask that question to understand the self. Yes. yes. Let me confess that I am less than a beginner, so my understanding may be naive. Uh, at the end of your talk, you, uh, you flagged a very interesting question uh, related to self and other. 
and if you complicate this question with the distinction that you made between primitive and organic and speculate on uh, on the relationship between self and other uh, with that understanding it would be nice for me to understand i should say i don't quite follow your question but then let me um uh, primitive versus organic and the other in the self uh, Primitive versus organic, uh, I just opposed uh, two ideas of looking at the self. One is uh, to attempt to uh, see the basic functions of self, which still could be called as a self, so minimal. And uh, for some of the neurophilosophers, it is ownership and agency. Organic is a counter view to it, that it is not that uh, the self comes with a set of primitive functions. It's always an organic sense, a different multiple aspects and makes their life experience enriched and so on and so forth. When I said about the other in the self, what I meant is that uh, a lot of what we experience is dependent on a world with which we interact, from where we learn with to which we share. And uh, philosophy has a lot to do with understanding the other in the self. I mean, I wouldn't go into it, but my favorite example for that, I'm sure in Western philosophy also it is there, but, but my own personal favorite is the Abhyasa Bhashi of Shankaracharya, who uh, discusses the, uh, the Asmad and Yushmad Prateya, and uh, Yushmad is all the other, the you, and finally he comes to all that which could be separated or taken away from the Asmad, the me, the I, as the Yushmad. Yeah, I think there's that person. Yes. Mike. My question is, uh, how do you define uh, the cultural body and how it is distinguished from the biological body and uh, which play an important role in our way of being in the world? Last question, please. I mean, I mean uh, which, uh, uh, which aspect of our body, I mean it's a biological or cultural, uh. play an important role in way of our being in the world? Very, I mean, very, very difficult to make any uh, kind of priority there, which is more important, which is culture or biology. For biology, culture is also part of biology. I mean, it's nothing culture is a kind of development of biology which we have. The human's biology is perfectionist uh, culture. And uh, so which one is important, the cultural part or the biological part? Uh, very difficult to answer. I, I mean, I can only remember uh, the movie Castaway, where uh, this guy's uh, body perfectly functions, but then he is with no companion, if any one of you have seen that movie, and then he has to take, convert a soccer ball to his friend. And the importance of that soccer ball is understood when he, actually the ball is lost and he feels alone once again. So companionship is something which is again very important, a friend to talk, a friend to share your tragedies and maladies, but his body is very good. Uh, so very difficult to make those distinctions, uh, but it's again an important question. Um, <coughs> funny that. Uh, so I have a few comments, but I'll try to be brief, as brief as possible. The mirror test, I'm not sure what it indicates. People have always conceived it as indicating self-recognition, but it's not entirely clear. There's a lot of debate about it. In fact, some animals that you missed out on this, pigeons, dolphins, dolphins. pigeons pass the mirror test. Dolphins. Some chimpanzees fail the mirror test. So uh, I think it's time to move beyond. And in fact, if you look at even animal um, research and animal um, cognition, I think, and in fact, even in our group, we've tried to uh, propose that there are other ways in which we can indicate or which uh, indicate to us that animals may have a sense of the self, which is not confined to a physical recognition of their body or their self, as is argued for in the case of the mirror test. So I think we need to go beyond that a bit. Uh, the second point is the minimalistic concept of the minimal self, I think is an evolutionally important concept because if you want to trace the evolutionary roots of what it is to have a self-sense, it's important to see what are the very first basic principles that we need to invoke. 
uh, thirdly and perhaps uh, oh uh, uh, yeah thirdly animals have been shown to have variations in their um, concept in their body sense so for example when individual animals are kept in isolation particularly in primates uh, they often do not recognize their limbs as being a part of their own body and attack it as if it's a foreign animal. So which clearly shows that even without going into abstract notions of self and beyond, uh, perhaps neurological mechanisms can explain some of these arguments that you've raised. And the final point therefore which leads to this is, I'm not sure I'm convinced, uh, as you suggest, that we do not have neural explanations or that neural explanations are inadequate to explain what you call a self-sense. Uh, also in your last slide you mentioned that cognitive neuroscience does away with the self-sense, which again I don't agree with. I think there is a very strong concept of the self uh, biologically, neurologically, and the arguments that you made earlier uh, about body maps or mirror neurons or proprioceptory uh, senses, I'm not sure that taken together they are completely inadequate to actually explain what you have argued as the self-sense. As usual, uh, Anitya won't surprise me because he is the flag holder of my strongest critique in this group and he is a biologist. Uh, well, I think uh, Anitya, uh, as a philosopher and as a person who believes in a deep sense of self, which uh, is not defined exhaustively by relating to its causal neural origins. I think we, we have two positions which are valid and which of course can be critiqued in, from both camps. Uh, my idea is that uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not contesting to view that there could be a minimal self uh, because even we have PCs which work with very minimal uh, microprocessing uh, processing power, right? I mean, you, you don't need a lot of processing power to have a PC run. So just like that, a, a live system can also be run perhaps with very minimal uh, possibilities, very minimal functions. But to me, when I talk about the self-sense, and of course I am not an expert in animal cognition, which you are, uh, I can only talk about the organic sense of the self which humans possess. And uh, I'm sure, and I'm, I mean, I'm very surprised to hear that you talk about animal uh, I mean, members of your own group of macaques who are who disown the body parts for whatever reason. Uh, I mean, in, in, in humans' case, there definitely is a neurological environment which causes uh, leads them to do that. Uh, so, but thanks for the comments. But I think uh, I, I I mean, of course, you said that the neural uh, uh, causation mechanisms and so on would be sufficient to explain the cell. And I think my point would be, yes, it is sufficient to explain the self, but the explanation will not exhaust the richness which is embedded in the possibility of experiencing even further. See, I have also a comment on uh, Anandya's, uh, what he said. See, we have distinguished between what cognitive science and what uh, neuroscience have been able to do is to give a correlation and description. But whether that is sufficient explanation is a different question altogether. Because the explanation is very different from, see, most of science is the problem. Most of science is able to describe and then correlate. But whether that is the true explanation that we are searching for is not very clear. Uh, there are some. I have a comment. Yeah, can I just, can I just add one line to that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to counteract that by saying that if you look at a phenomenon uh, such as uh, blind sight, I think you have a very good causal mechanism by which individual humans or non-humans are able to perform extremely complex tasks which apparently require cognitive processing and which do, but without being aware that they are actually processing the task. And you are of course familiar with these examples. You can make a monkey walk through a room full of obstacles. You can make a human being walk through a room full of obstacles. And then when you question the human being, he will say that he's blind and he did not know how he did it. And there's no reason to believe that he's lying. So 
So here is a very nice example of where you can actually severe the connections to the primary visual cortex and allow an individual to actually carry out complex visual tasks without being aware that he's doing it. And that, to me, is a very fundamental property of consciousness, of trying to actually, of knowing what you're doing, and you can actually causally cause a disconnect between the two. Okay, I have a small one. This is rather peripheral to your talk, but I uh, just wanted to um, talk a little bit about the notion of body. And I think, um, you know, scholarship coming out of feminist studies and disability studies, um, also, you know, the philosophical tradition of these studies have sort of questioned the strictly physiological understanding of body, right? Um, so it's not, it, it, it may not be useful to only think about it as a machine where all parts sort of work in unison. So I think that has been questioned, so probably something like that, because, you know, some, some bodies, you know, bodies are inherently classed and gendered, and some bodies get violated, and some bodies get worshipped, and so on and so forth. It's, it's extremely, you know, it, it's inherently sort of problematic notion um, to sort of think about this uni unity, to assume this unity. Um, you know, uh, of body. I completely agree with you, Shivani. Of course, you are in my camp. Uh, well, the whole idea of a peripersonal space helps us to critique even the biological, strictly biologically, physical limit of the body because it includes the space around the body, which in, you know, which is comprising of objects, people, values, attitudes, and so on. So, body may not be a uh, purely corporeal physical entity can be something more and it has a lot of uh, philosophical implications once I mean it's a Pandora's box once you talk I mean once you bring in peripersonal space in conjunction with discussing body uh, yeah, I mean it opens up a whole lot of issues it's I have a question I thought he was raising I his hand for a while no I was raising earlier and Dr. Shrikant and saw me Um, regarding body absence and self sense, the real hard problem. Is it possible there is a self that is conscious? Is it the same as the mind? I don't know if psychologists would agree or neurobiologists would agree. Can the self also encompass body sense? You've only explained the Western thought on what is self. Can you juxtapose that with the Eastern philosophy of mystical theories of what is self? And can that also include the body sense rather than absence? Uh, I agree with you, uh, Deepi. I mean, I didn't talk about Eastern traditions because that's not the subject of this morning's topic. And my idea is to just focus on even the conceptual possibility of distinguishing the body sense and the self sense. Once we come to mysticism, there are no distinctions, no demarcations. Everything is unified, everything is one. And then I won't be able to have this audience this morning to discuss, since because we all believe in one and there's no uh, debate like possible. But I agree with you and it's a very valid point. Of course, there are traditions which believe that and uh, I think in the beginning I showed you there's two big uh, groups. One group is which says self-sense is the body sense. And the other is the self sense is the essence. So, which and body embodiment is only one aspect of the self. I think I mentioned. Thanks for the comment. Um, if I understand the heart, heart problem correctly, it is probably how consciousness arises in a purely physical world, uh, which is Jayo Kim's uh, book, probably the mental in a purely non physical world. But you started out uh, posing a new new heart problem. I. I think I have failed in getting the essence of your question. How an emphasize on sensitive motoric representations or embodiment or whatsoever, uh, probably these were the key, key notions in your talk. The emphasize or a, a new dimension of the whole question, which is still very much there. How do you, how do you explain the quality of subjectivity that is there uh, in a purely physical structure? Yes, uh, you must be already familiar that the heart problem is a problem which is caused by a philosopher. I mean, a mathematician turned philosopher. So there are already philosophical implications in the heart problem. 
which is basically how is that uh, discrete physical neural processes give rise to something which is unitary, subjective, qualitative sense of conscious feeling, the subjective feeling. That is the heart problem. And uh, what I thought uh, is important is that too much has been discussed on the heart problem and lots and lots of riddles are coming because uh, this, it gives you the possibility of more and more philosophical puzzles. But uh, what is central to the heart problem is the question, are we talking about the self sense which is subjective, the body sense which is caused by physical parameters, are we able to separate them even conceptually to begin with? And then along we need to talk about how they combine to give rise to something to change. So even the idea of separating the body sense and self sense, to me, as much as I have understood, it is, it is something extremely difficult. I mean, I, it doesn't mean that that's a position I hold, but, uh, but the, the more you understand and go into the studies, to, to separate body sense and self sense is something which is very complex. I mean, unless we get into philosophies, uh, you know, more idealistic positions, uh, if you are talking about everyday experiences, uh, the body sense, self sense is a kind of entangled, intertwined sense, very difficult to separate it. And so the entanglement of the, uh, the mechanisms of the motor abilities and the ability of yourself as the motivator of those motor abilities, they are kind of mixed up. We, are, we know that they are there, but if in order to extricate these two separately, I don't know how many more years we would need because perhaps even that uh, the, the method or the, even the approach to do such a thing is not sufficient or not ne necessary. The entanglement is the fact of life. Possible. Uh, you, you mentioned there is source of work. Uh, at least the team has a thing for the point that our kind of understanding of physicality of you know, what physicists believe as, as, as physical and what uh, metaphysical. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is pretty magic. Uh, well, uh, Strawson has made a very good attempt. I mean, he talks about these gradations of self, he himself talks about minimal self. But mind you, philosophically, he is a reductionist. And he doesn't want to look into anything which is more than what could be called as minimal. So he would definitely be, be able to be friendly with an NPA and see what is the biological mechanism which is finally uh, you know, very helpful to you to see something as something very causal and can be biologically explained in a neat fashion. But is that enough? Is it? To me, I am very naive to this subject. To me, both the self sense and body sense appear dynamic concepts. Yes. Do they not change over a period of time? What happens at the time of the birth of a person? What happens over a period of time and at the time of death? Do we therefore say that over a period of time the relationship between the two changes and as many philosophers say, the self-sense should die before the sense of body. Sorry. Last point? The self-sense oh. that should disappear before the body disappears. You mean in a philosophical context, right? Well, the last part is I think the self-sense what philosophically means is a kind of an ego individualistic sense should die. Uh, before uh, your body dies, because then you understand what you are in a, bet in a better manner. Uh, the, the more important question which you asked at the beginning, that uh, would the body sense and the self sense change over a period of time? Uh, I would think some aspects of it, yes, they do change, and biologically we know that. Uh, our abilities, for example, our ability to keep balance, it uh, reduces as we age our capacity to move fast or make uh, uh, kind of movements and to take uh, immediate postures, it reduces, availability reduces. Uh, and of course the other internal senses, I mean for sure, as we age, uh, the sensation, I mean the ability for sensory capabilities also reduce, they change. The self-sense of what changes, I mean, it's a very important question. I'm not sure whether I'll be able to answer you completely in that. What aspects of the self-sense would change? Uh, uh, I would think uh, a, a lot many aspects of the self-sense would change. But then there is also something which stays, which is unchanged. 
which uh, philosophically you can put as the core self, uh, which, is, which is not a structured part of the self, but it is a non-structured part of this self. But then the self is also formed of several structures, which enables us to interact with the world, which keeps changing, because as we change our lifestyle, as we change our attitudes, uh, as we change uh, the way we respond to situations, we change, no doubt about it. I mean, I, perhaps I, 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 you know, I would get very angry 10 years before with small things, but now my ability to control my anger is much more. So, I mean, I just took an example of anger, but then there are many complex decision making which we do, perhaps in a better fashion, as we gain more experience, as we, I mean, age, of course, is a big factor, but uh, I think more important is the more inputs which comes to us enables us to make more complex decision making, more effective decision making. Thanks. Yes, sir. Basically, introduced by two psychiatric syndromes, the depersonalization syndrome and the derealization syndrome, which are considered as disorders of self. These two syndromes are characterized by anxiety, extreme anxiety and panic. I mean, there is a sense of non-reality about the self. So, what I feel, just to pose me this with Vedanta, is that if you are divested of your lower self, able to connect yourself with the higher self, that is a pretty tiny thing to be. So this is just to add to. Yes, I completely ag ag agree with you, doctor. Uh, well, in fact, in some of the psychotherapic methods, you try to relate to a person self, which is a core, not something which is fleeting. And our ability to relate to something which is deeper allows us to help cope with the fluctuations in the more apparent and superficial levels. So even psychiatrically, in, in a therapy-wise, it's very important that we have levels of self so that we have more possibility of adjusting and we don't have a complete collapse. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Uh, my question for you is, um, have you, maybe you've explored quantum physics to explain some of these things? physics is one of the candidates for all this, but there is no very good uh, effort at understanding these problems in terms of mental Yeah, I think Tabas has something to respond to. There is a journal which is published for the last 10 years called Neuropontology. And uh, very interestingly, uh, in the recent past year, the papers from St. Louis University and other places which speculate that there is a uh, subtle body, a parallel body, which is a, a quantum body and which is constructed out of dark matter. It's a whole different subject and it entangles electron by electron, molecule by molecule with the physical body. So anyway, just to expose you to neuropontology. I can give you more information later. But these are all still I have one question. You spoke about the entanglement of body sense and self sense. So in people who are, have a limited or loss of proprioception, you related the minimal self to ownership and agency. So in people like these, so what kind of a minimal self remains because they have lost ownership and agentic function of the body? Well, this is a question which I wish to ask, uh, I mean, to a larger audience who are interested in this part of the field. Uh, the, the Yes, that's right. I mean, the ownership sense is definitely disrupted because uh, you show a waving hand on the mirror and uh, you would think that it is your own hand whereby it is somebody else's hand being waved on the mirror. Uh, so, so the minimal self definitely is disrupted sense. So what is the self sense which remains in a person with a disability, with a physical dis disability, a quadriplegic? Uh, I would think it is, one is the ability to experience oneself 
in a, in a kind of extended fashion, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the context of personal identity. I mean, if at all we are talking in a psychological sense. Because you are not only uh, something which is created in the moment or experiencing in the moment, but you are also something which you experienced over a period of time, which is called as a narrative self. That is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, which, which is something which I would like to explore more, is the possibility of a core self, which is unstructured, but allows you to uh, still see something, uh, in the, perhaps in a detached manner. I mean, it gets into more philosophical riddles, uh, but that's one possibility. Well, if there are no other questions, I would like to ask one short question. The, every cell of our body, yes. all the cells, are supposed to change. How is this uh, self feeling of uh, myself maintained in all this change? Yeah, I think that is what uh, Tabas uh, raised in the very first step. How can, if everything, uh, I mean, I mean, maybe you should repeat, uh, you should respond to that comment. Well, if everything is changing, then uh, what is this, what is the static place where things can be changed? So the mind is changing, the body is changing, whatever you yeah, which means you have to postulate something which is unchanging. So which comes to philosophy. <laughs> yeah, but comes to philosophy, but I want to know whether there is any biological explanation. Well, I don't think biologists would have anything which is unchanging. <laughs> would you have a concept of anything which is unchanging, which stays the same? Of course. Okay. Absolutely. All right. I don't think this is a problem at all. Okay. In fact, if you, if you think of a memory, it's some sense of memory static. You still remember what you did when you were 10 years old and you can do that with your dying day. So there are things which are static. There are mental maps where the ch your finger might be chopped off, but there is a mental map which has already mapped the cells of the region. And so if you can stimulate that part of the brain, you get the sensation that the finger is itchy. So I still, that's the point I was trying to make, that I, I'm still not sure that we are faced with things with any new kind of a problem that cannot yet be explained by the kind of neurological or brain mechanisms and structures. And so I think you can have a personal thought. But I don't remember what, what I was or what I did when I was two years old. Oh, back. absolutely. So that is change. But so there is change. But then there are also certain things that don't change, that you can remember for a long period of time. I think what Anindya says is there are certain representations in the brain Absolutely. which uh, goes to perhaps not only your body, which are kind of even, you know, I mean, it, it could, I mean, even for example, the genetic material, the kind of imprint of something which is much more than what you are, right? I mean, you have, you have carried a lot of other things also in that. From previous generation. Yeah, previous generation. But I think the larger question that we do agree, I mean, uh, but the larger question philosophically, because this, these ideas are also, we have to admit they are riddled with philosophical issues. I, I, I don't think it is just a biological issue or a scientific issue because the moment we are talking about the idea of self, we have already landed in a philosophical space because otherwise we don't even have to talk about ourselves because we can explain everything in terms of that. Well, I, I think we should not, uh, you know, water this in biography and science and biology because a simple question needs to be answered. All questions need to be answered. Like you just mentioned, uh, Let us thank Professor uh, Mellon for this excellent talk. And uh, we have all been.